Hello, and welcome to AMFT's At Home series. My name is Chris Michaels, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for AMFT. Welcome to part three of our At Home series. Over the past two weeks, you have welcomed us into your homes as we have come together as a community to face this challenge. We have had attendees join us from around the globe, including US, Bahamas, Canada, Germany, Ireland, Mexico, Mongolia, Philippines, South Africa, Taiwan, United Kingdom, and Vietnam. I am hopeful in our future sessions, we can continue to connect with our MFTs from every corner of the world. And speaking of future sessions, I'm pleased to announce the speakers for our final at-home sessions. Next Friday, May 8th, we will be joined by Dr. Sue Johnson, who will be discussing how we can take care of our most important relationships during these challenging times. On Friday, May 15th, our at-home session will welcome Dr. David Schnart, who will join us to discuss how modern brain science offers us understanding into how we can better understand the mental health needs of our traumatized nations and impact mental health care for the future. And finally, on Friday, May 22nd, we will host our final at-home session with Dr. Throma Walsh, where she will be discussing love, loss, and grief in the time of the coronavirus. Registration for these sessions can be done at amft.org forward slash at home. I encourage you to visit our website at amft.org slash coronavirus for up to the minute news and links. And for our AMFT members, keep your eye on the Family Therapy e-news <clears throat> as we launch even more resources and virtual events to keep you connected. Today's session is being sponsored by CPH and Associates. As the endorsed professional liability insurance provider for AMFT members, CPH and Associates is proud to sponsor the AMFT at home series. CPH provides portable occurrence form coverage that protects you throughout your professional career. During this time of evolving practices, CPH is pleased to assure you that your policy covers telehealth services, as long as such services are permitted under your state's law. A policy with CPH provides peace of mind so you can focus on your career. Get policy highlights and an instant quote online at www.cphins.com. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Michael Yapko. Dr. Yapko is a clinical psychologist residing near San Diego, California. He is internationally recognized for his work in clinical hypnosis and outcome-focused psychotherapy, especially in the treatment of major depression, routinely teaching to professional audiences all over the world. He has been invited to present his innovative ideas and methods to colleagues in more than 30 countries across six continents and all over the United States. Dr. Gapko has had a special interest which spans more than four decades in the intricacies of brief and strategic therapy, the clinical applications of hyp hypnosis, and the treating the disorder of major depression. He is the author of 15 books and editor of three others, as well as numerous book chapters and articles on the subjects of the brief therapy of depression and the use of clinical hypnosis in strategic psychotherapy. His books include his classic text on clinical hypnosis, trans work and introduction to the practice of clinical hypnosis, fifth edition, the discriminating therapist, asking how questions, making distinctions and finding direction in therapy, and mindfulness and hypnosis, the power of suggestion to transform experience. He is also a consultant to and content provider for the popular hypnotherapy phone app Mindset. More information about Dr. Yapko's work is available on his website, www.yapko.com. Please welcome Dr. Yapko. Thank you so much for that introduction, Chris. I want to begin by expressing my thanks to AAMFT for even making this presentation possible. I think that they've been doing an amazing job of organizing these things and, and uh, having these available to their membership. Well, I want to start by telling you about something that happened that was life-changing for me when I was just 19 years old. And I was an undergraduate student at University of Michigan at the time. And I was studying psychology and becoming very earnest in my studies. And 
we were in a very heavily psychoanalytically oriented program and we were essentially told don't bother to study hypnosis freud abandoned it there's really nothing that, there that you need to study i received a flyer in the mail and it was for a two-day hypnosis workshop uh, clinical applications of hypnosis so i was intrigued i immediately registered for it that should tell you something about my personality and I was really curious. I knew nothing about hypnosis at all. All I knew was what I saw on television and in stage shows and ridiculous demonstrations of the power of hypnosis. Well, this was a clinical training and that interested me. It made conceptual sense to me that if we can influence people for the worse, or that people can make themselves feel worse, that people should be able to influence others for the better and people should be able to make themselves feel better. So I went to this workshop, it was interesting. The first day was pretty much theoretical of what hypnosis is and how it works and what it can be used for and what the various hypnotic phenomena are and all of those kinds of things. And all of that I found very, very interesting. It made me think a lot about the power of words, the power of language, the way that we use suggestions in our work uh, and, and do so inevitably. There, there's really no way to escape using suggestion in your work. But what was particularly fascinating for me and life-changing was on the second day of this workshop when he wanted to do a clinical demonstration with someone and I had never seen a clinical demonstration of hypnosis. So I grabbed a seat up front and I wanted to see up close what really went on here. Where was the mind control and where were all the things that I had been so steeped in misconceptions about? And he got a volunteer, a woman, I would guess she was probably in her 40s. And he interviewed her and she told the very sad tale of how she had been leading a normal life, a vital life, happened to be a therapist herself with a good clinical practice and life was okay. And then she was in a terrible car accident and she was very severely injured, lots of broken bones, lots of lacerated organs, lots of time in the hospital. It was a really bad accident and she suffered terribly. Well, that accident had happened probably three years earlier. And she reported during the interview then how she had slowly recovered and was doing pretty well, except for this chronic pain that was in her leg. And she had had all kinds of treatment for it, surgical procedures, medical procedures, medications, all kinds of things. And the pain was so unrelenting and was so awful that it literally disrupted her entire life. She couldn't focus on hardly anything else. It made it hard to work. It made it hard for her to do anything. So I'm sitting there listening to this lady describe this terrible experience and, and, the, and the residuals of this accident. And I'm thinking to myself, what can this guy possibly say to her that's gonna make any difference in her life? What can he possibly say to her that could make a difference? So I'm watching, and at one point, the interview comes to a stop, and then he starts talking to her about doing hypnosis, invites her to close her eyes, encourages her to start relaxing and focusing on her breathing, a very gentle orientation towards internal experience for a while, which is pretty typical of hypnotic procedures, encouraging people to focus inwardly. So as he's talking with her, the first 10, 15 minutes was just general relaxation suggestions, nothing earth shattering, nothing really remarkable. And I'm still sitting there waiting for the mind control things that were all I knew about hypnosis, all the myths and misconceptions that I had in my mind, despite the lectures the previous day. And then he started talking to her about visualizing the pain in her leg, turning into a dark, viscous liquid 
that would slowly, gradually flow down her leg and eventually would flow out of her big toe into her shoes and would eventually overflow her shoes and become a puddle of pain on the floor. Now I'm kind of looking around the room wondering, does anybody else think that this guy is having a psychotic reaction right now? What kind of imagery is this? How bizarre. And it was my ignorance. I didn't have a clue as to what he was doing or how he was doing it. But as he's progressing with this session, you had to see this woman's face. It was on her face what was happening. And I could not wait to hear what her description was going to be about what was happening. What did she think about these weird suggestions about a viscous liquid and a puddle of pain on the floor? So the session went on for probably 45 minutes or so. And I was just paying rapt attention to what he was saying and how he was saying it and watching every move he was making and the look on her face as she was processing all of these suggestions. And then finally, he brings the session to a close and invites her to uh, open her eyes and, and reorient completely. And then he didn't say anything. And she just sat there for what seemed to me a very long period of time. And then she started to very softly cry. And then she said, this is the first time in three years that I haven't been in pain. And I thought to myself in that moment, I have got to learn how to do this. I have spent now the last almost half century, studying intensively how people process information and the recognition that when people are in hypnosis, they process information differently. And if you had said to this woman ahead of time, I'm going to do this session with you and you're going to be pain free, you can understand how she would be more than skeptical. She'd already been through so many things that didn't help. And how could she possibly have known that this would? But this is the value of hypnosis. You're creating through this very special quality of interaction, a type of relationship, a type of context where people can discover resources they didn't even know they had. What is so powerfully growth oriented about these experiences? Well, think about it. For this woman to go through this experience, when she finally sits up and opens her eyes and can verify that she's now pain free, what does that do to her self image? How does it change how she thinks about herself? What does it say to her about resources that she has inside that she didn't know she had. And until you create a context where people can go inside and find these resources and how to mobilize them and place those resources in the situations where people need to have them, well, that's what counters the old mythology that somehow hypnosis is going to help people lose control of themselves rather than gain control. This woman learned that she was capable of regulating sensation in her body. She learned that she was capable of turning off or ignoring pain signals. And this is what allowed her to then get her life back on track, to stop taking or reduce the number of medications that she was taking, to start living again, to resume her clinical practice and start building her life back again. What an extraordinary experience. And I count myself as so incredibly lucky that at age 19, at the very, very beginning of my career, that I was exposed to this phenomenal, demonstration of what human potential really means. And so here we are at this point in our lives 
with this COVID-19 global pandemic that is the concern of everyone. The levels of anxiety and depression rising daily for countless numbers of people. People who are feeling disempowered, people who are feeling victimized by the circumstances, people who aren't coping very well. And to be able to help people discover resources in themselves is an invaluable quality of intervention. And of course, this goes way beyond just having a conversation with someone. It goes beyond logic. And that in itself is a really fascinating thing. It isn't logical to talk to somebody about their pain turning into a viscous liquid and then a puddle of pain on the floor. It isn't logical, but it works. And people are capable of absorbing experiences and generating meaningful experiences that go way beyond the confines of trying to just think rationally about their life experience. So what I hope to be able to do in this relatively short time that we're together is to orient you to what the potentials of hypnosis are, what the value of hypnosis can be, and to teach you a few things about hypnosis that I'm hoping that you'll find interesting. So with that as an introduction, let's go ahead and get rolling on it. The first thing that I think you can probably appreciate is that this quality of interaction raises a lot of important questions. Things that even now as you're sitting and listening to me and watching me, I'm hoping that these are questions that occur to you about what kind of an experience could possibly help someone in chronic pain just by talking to them. Well, there's the first question. How does pain attention or focusing translate into these non-volitional or automatic yet meaningful responses. This is one of the most curious aspects of hypnosis. It's a phenomenon called automaticity. The fact that I can introduce through suggestion ideas for different shifts in experience, which I'll describe in just a moment, and these things seem to just happen. And when people describe their therapy experiences with hypnosis, people will often talk about all these remarkable changes that took place for them that seemed to just happen. Why do some people respond so dramatically to experiential processes like hypnosis or mindfulness, finding them transformative while others respond minimally? Many of you won't have had hypnosis training, which I think is unfortunate. I hope you'll pursue some. But many of you have pursued training in mindfulness and do guided mindfulness meditations, which are structurally identical to hypnosis sessions. They differ in their intentions, but the procedures of using focusing are great parallels. Well, if you've done any hypnosis or any mindfulness for any length of time, then you already know the differences in response. There are some people that you'll do a guided meditation with, and when it's over, they'll sit up and open their eyes and they'll go, wow, that was amazing. And other people who will sit up and open their eyes and go, uh, so what? And it's not much of an experience at all. What is it about the quality of responsiveness and is that unique to just hypnosis and mindfulness, or is this what regulates therapy responses? Which is why every therapist should really be interested in that exact question. As a therapist, you know that there are some clients that you work with that you tell them what you think they could do, or you give them a perspective about how they could look at things, and they go, wow, you're a genius, you're amazing, and they're so responsive, and then they send you Christmas cards every year and tell you how wonderful you are, and then there's other people that you can work with them and work with them and work with them, and they never really seem to get anywhere. What is that quality of responsiveness? And this is one of the questions that the field of hypnosis has been asking for nearly a century, because people do differ so radically in their ability to respond to these kinds of suggested experiences. That's what raises the next question then of what determines someone's capacity to respond. Is this something that's genetically determined? Is this about fixed personality traits? Are these malleable traits? Which is really what the next question is all about. 
what are these different factors? How does the role of expectation play? What is this phenomenon called suggestibility? And what about the role of dissociation that in client responsiveness? And is there anything that we can do to increase the quality of a client's responsiveness? Well, these questions are great questions and they're gonna be the backbone of the things that I'm gonna talk about for the next 45 minutes or so. Well, the very first lesson that you learn when you study hypnosis is that what you focus on, you amplify in your awareness. What you focus on, you amplify. And every therapeutic model, every approach to therapy emphasizes focus on one aspect of experience or another. That if you're a cognitive therapist, you're gonna focus on cognition. If you're an emotion-focused therapist, you're gonna focus on emotion. If you're an interpersonal therapist, you're gonna focus on relationship. So every therapy has a focus the question is, how do we deepen that focus? How do we make it more experiential? And why do we want to focus on that particular element of experience? How does it help someone to have that quality of focus? How does it work against someone to have that quality of focus? So this is, I think, a really important point because one of the ways to think about the whole essence of people's problems is that people's problems are problems of focus. People focus on the past that's unchangeable instead of focusing on the future and all the future possibilities that life has to offer. People who focus on their feelings when they should be thinking. People who are thinking when they should be focused on their feelings. People who are focused on themselves when they should be paying attention to their kids or their partner. People who are focused on their partner or kids when they should be focused on themselves. So I can go on, but you get the point that people's problems are very often caused by engaging with focusing on aspects of experience that are at odds with what they're trying to accomplish. And really, in a nutshell, what hypnosis is about is grabbing people's attention, securing people's attention, and redirecting it. Where can I move this person's attention to? What can I encourage them to engage with that's going to be helpful to them? And of course, that's what you would hope to be doing in therapy anyway. But hypnosis gives you a greater insight into what elements of experience are going to be critical components of the solution to whatever it is that they're experiencing. So to be able to pay attention with intention is one of the divergent points from mindfulness approaches. Now, I happen to be a big fan of mindfulness. As Chris mentioned in my introduction, I wrote a book called Mindfulness and Hypnosis. And after studying mindfulness for many years and seeing in it so many parallels to hypnosis, but mindfulness describes itself most often as paying attention without intention. Hypnosis is about attention with intention. That when you do a hypnosis session, it's for a purpose. That when this clinical demonstration that I described earlier began, it was with the intention of helping this woman find a way to have some pain relief. And that was the goal, and he used a series of strategies to help her accomplish that goal, which he was able to do. Well, when people experience focus, they enter a state of dissociation. When I'm focused here, it means I'm not focused there. When I'm absorbed in this, it means I'm not paying attention to that. And the textbook definition of dissociation is breaking a global experience into its component parts. So part of the decision making in conducting a session, whether it's a therapy session with or without hypnosis, what elements of experience do I want to amplify in this person's awareness? Which ones do I want to de-amplify? But it's what allows shifts to take place. Shifts in physiology 
as the person's breathing changes and as their body relaxes, shifts in sensory perception as people feel closer to or more distant from, or parts get bigger or parts get smaller, parts get more sensitive, parts get less sensitive through the suggestions that you provide. Cognitive shifts that take place as people's thoughts get more focused and clearer. Affective shifts that take place that when you're encouraging people to develop more compassion, more kindness, more curiosity. Certainly curiosity is one of the most important uh, emotions there is that drives wanting to know, wanting to learn, and growing, and growing past what people are experiencing. Behavioral shifts that take place as people experiment with new behaviors. Temporal shifts. Am I gonna focus this person on the past and past experiences? Am I gonna focus them on this moment and being present in this moment? Am I gonna focus them on the future and, and focus them on possibilities for new things that they can experience? So all of these kinds of shifts that take place are pretty powerful. Well, I wanna share with you a couple of recent uh, neuroscientific studies that make the point in a different way. You know, hypnosis now is at the forefront of brain research. Neuroscientists are asking obvious questions like, what's going on in the brains of somebody who can have surgery without a chemical anesthetic? People who are literally going to have their bodies cut open with hypnosis as the only anesthetic. Now, that probably sounds fantastic to you if you've never seen it done. And it is fantastic. I have been party to that kind of procedure countless times over the course of my career, and it still amazes me. But to want to study the brains of people demonstrating these remarkable phenomena makes sense. It teaches us something about what goes on in people's brains, how focus affects brain processing, what the relationship is between mind and brain. So one of these studies, just to, I hope, intrigue you a little bit, was a PET scan study that was done at Harvard University a few years ago. And this was a study addressing the question, can you use hypnosis to alter color perception? So before hypnosis was induced, a research subject, a series of research subjects, were placed in a PET scanner and they were shown a series of cards. Some of the cards had figures that were in black and white. Some of the cards had figures that were in color. And by looking at each of these cards, it became very clear very quickly that different parts of the brain would become active when someone was looking at something in black and white versus when they were looking at something in color. So you could literally look at the brain scan to see, are they looking at something in black and white? Or are they looking at something in color right now? Then hypnosis was induced. And then they were given the suggestion. In just a moment, I'm going to show you the color card again, one of the color cards. In actuality, they were handed a black and white card. Can you guess? which part of the brain lit up. So even though they were given a black and white card, they were given the suggestion it was going to be a color card, and it was the color part of the brain that lit up, that became active. The person responded to the suggested reality, not the actual reality. That is fascinating. There's another study that was done recently at University of Oslo in Norway. And this was a study that involved the use of pupillometrics, measuring the pupil of the eye. Well, as you very likely know, the eye pupil dilates and the eye pupil constricts depending on the amount of light that it's exposed to. So when it's bright outside, the 
pupil of the eye will constrict. When it's darker, the pupil of the eye will dilate. This is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. This is, in theory, not something under conscious control. So these researchers did the condition before hypnosis of measuring the person's pupil size and turning down the lights, turning up the lights, and measuring the degree of expansion, dilation, or constriction. Then they did hypnosis. Then they suggested, okay, now we're going to turn down the lights in the room. The lights are being turned down now. You can tell the lights are being turned down. The person's eyes, the pupils would dilate. Then they would say, okay, now we're going to turn the light back up. It's going to get brighter in the room. And as it gets brighter in the room, your pupils will naturally constrict. Well, here's the catch. In reality, they never changed the quality of lighting in the room. All they did was suggest that the room was going to get brighter, suggest that the room was going to get dimmer. And again, research subjects responded to the suggested reality, not the actual reality. Now start to think about that and its applications, especially in light of this global pandemic. One of the things we are concerned about and should be concerned about are the mental health consequences of this pandemic. Right now we're dealing with life and death, who gets infected and what the death rate is going to be. But one day, hopefully, sooner rather than later, when this pandemic winds down, when we have better treatments and perhaps even vaccinations, we're gonna be dealing with the emotional fallout. And for you to have an experiential tool like hypnosis available to you, where you can speak to the automatic responses that people generate. Think about how automatic PTSD responses are. Think about how automatic and dissociated people are when they have these spontaneous regressions that we call flashbacks. Or even think about highly anxious people who don't do flashbacks, they do flash forwards. They project themselves into the future facing the worst possible conditions and then react in the present as if that's actually happening. People who lose the boundaries that separate now from before or now from later. Well, now I'm talking about boundaries. And of course, as soon as you start to talk about boundaries, we're talking about what is called compartmentalization. Let me share with you again some information about that. So if we're going to talk about compartmentalization skills, Oh, for some reason, this is, there we go. Think about the role of compartmentalization as it plays out in any therapy. This is what's so imperative in understanding about the phenomenon of dissociation. Unfortunately, most clinicians, when they learn about dissociation, they only learn about it in the psychopathological sense. They learn about psychogenic amnesia and fugue states and dissociative identity disorder. And certainly those are negative applications of dissociation. But dissociation, like all of the hypnotic phenomena, like all of life experiences, are neutral. In one context, what works against someone works really well for somebody in another context. All of the value of these experiences depends on the circumstances. Well, on this particular slide, you can see the ability to compartmentalize, to separate elements of experience is fundamental to any therapeutic change. You have to be able to detach from the pain in order to manage it. 
you have to be able to detach from the feelings if you're going to learn to think more rationally in a situation. You're going to have to learn to detach from the past traumas if you're going to move forward with your life in a way that's positive and healthy. Think about the, the frontline workers now during this pandemic. When you see them interviewed, every one of them admits readily they are scared. They are scared to go into the hospital. They are scared of being exposed. They're scared of getting the virus. They're scared of contaminating their families. They're scared, and yet they go in anyways. And how often therapists will say some variation of feel the fear and do it anyway. But I'm now talking about a mechanism for making that possible. Not everyone can feel the fear and do it anyway. Not if they don't have compartmentalization skills. Not if they're not good at dissociating elements of experience. Here's yet another reason to want to learn hypnosis so that you have a vehicle. You're providing the how in how someone's going to be able to set aside the fear and do what needs to be done. You know as well as I do that if anybody's going to progress, it's going to be because they are able to move beyond, move outside of their comfort zone. That requires a capacity for compartmentalization. To be able to detach from situational triggers in order to react differently. To be able to separate from being judgmental or just being idealistic and be more accepting about the reality of circumstances in a sophisticated way. And even in terms of regulating your own internal environment. You know, if you care what other people think of you, and you should, it's social responsibility, you're gonna have an inner critic. The fact that you have an inner critic is hardly unusual. You know, everybody with a conscience does. But then the question is, so how do you respond to it? How do you detach from that inner critic when it's criticizing you unreasonably, unfairly, in order to be more compassionate with yourself, to be less judgmental with other people? All of these skills that we prize so highly in the world of therapy are made easier and more deliberate the more that you understand the value of hypnosis as a treatment tool. So it's important to appreciate that that ability to detach from your thoughts, from your feelings, is pretty critical to be able to transform any aspects of your life. But this is a hypnotic capability, the capacity for dissociation that allows you to respond to new possibilities suggested realities that a therapist provides. Well, even in the context of doing guided mindfulness meditations, you're using the same kinds of dissociative suggestions. Here they are. As soon as you tell someone to focus on your breathing, you're telling them to separate their awareness from other parts of life experience that if you're gonna focus on breathing, it means everything else needs to be detached and move into the background. That if you're gonna tell them to focus on relaxing, you're telling them to focus on their physical experience. And once again, everything else needs to be detached and move into the background. If you're gonna say, focus on my words, you're suggesting that the person suspend paying attention to internal dialogue or any other external distractions, detaching from those other things in order to focus on you and what you're saying. And if you're going to suggest something like an externalization strategy, a very common suggestion, especially in the world of mindfulness, is see your thoughts as if they're out there. Put your thoughts on a leaf and watch the leaf go floating downstream. See your thoughts as clouds in the sky floating away from you. That kind of externalization strategy is based on the capacity for compartmentalization. Well, now for the remainder of my talk, then, I want to move from some of the general points about hypnosis that I hope are understandable to you to get much more specific now about what that means 
in terms of doing actual treatment utilizing hypnosis. Now, obviously, this isn't a hypnosis training course, as if you could almost learn hypnosis in an hour. I've been studying hypnosis now for nearly half a century, and there's still so much that I don't understand, despite that it's been my focus for all of this time, despite the fact that I wrote the leading textbook in the field. There's a lot that I do understand, but there's still a lot that I don't. But I'm hoping to mobilize in you a recognition that here is an important ability to help people focus and focus on the aspects of, aspects of experience that are gonna be helpful to them. Well, in this particular time, dealing with this global pandemic, we see so clearly how predisposing risk factors lead to two very different extreme responses. We see people who during this pandemic are thriving. They're learning new skills, they're reading more books, they're spending more time, they're taking online trainings, they're out on their patio yelling at their neighbors uh, to stay connected, they're out on their balconies singing to each other, they're doing fine. And then there's other people who are barely able to get out of bed, who are shivering and shaking and crying and barely, barely coping. What are the predisposing risk factors? And these become the targets of hypnotic-based treatment or even mindfulness-based treatment if you are going to be intentional about your use of this kind of focusing strategy. So the two patterns, there are more than two patterns, but given the limited amount of time, I really just wanted to, to address the two main ones that I see as being critically important to shaping people's responses to this pandemic. The first is how people deal with ambiguity. Ambiguity. You know, the, the thing about life is that life is uncertain. Life doesn't come with an innate meaning. We give life meaning through the choices that we make. But one of the things that we know is that people differ dramatically in how well they tolerate ambiguity. And one of the things that we know from the robust research literature is that people who are prone to anxiety and depression have a very low tolerance for ambiguity. Ambiguity for them represents a real strong risk factor for anxiety and depression. And the reasons why are probably pretty obvious. Ambiguity invites projection. Because ambiguity is is reflected in situations that don't have any innate meaning, we give it meaning. So we call somebody and they don't call us back. Simple example, but then we start asking, why didn't they call us back? And then come the ruminations. Well, maybe they're mad at me. Maybe they don't like me anymore. And the quality of your projections in the face of uncertainty is going to either increase or decrease your vulnerability to anxiety and depression. I'll say more about that in just a moment. And then the rumination that's related to the ambiguity is that rumination means spinning around over and over and over again, endlessly analyzing and analyzing at the expense of taking effective action. Well, with this pandemic, the ambiguities that provide plenty to ruminate about are obvious. As soon as we start asking the big questions, what if I get the virus? What if somebody I love gets the virus? What if somebody I love dies from the virus? When will we have a vaccine? Will we ever have a vaccine? Will people be able to get it? Will I be able to go back to work? Will I be able to see my friends? What's gonna to happen to my income? How am I gonna pay the rent? And people asking question after question after question, and it's understandable why they would ask those questions. But part of what we're needing to train people to do is learn how to not ask unanswerable questions. Well, as I say, these two patterns are especially prominent now with the COVID virus. 
So when we start thinking about what we can do hypnotically, and even with therapy, not using hypnosis, but hypnosis amplifies the merits. We can use hypnosis for symptom management. We can use hypnosis for reducing risk factors. Well, the, the great psychologist and anxiety expert, David Barlow, talked about what drives anxiety is people overestimating risk and underestimating their personal resources. There's so much more to say about that, but this gives you a target. How do we help people estimate risk more carefully? And of course, risk is in the eye of the beholder. There are some people who don't think that jumping out of an airplane with a parachute on their back is very risky. And then there's other people who think it's really risky to try a new pizza place. So risk is in the eye of the beholder. And what about underestimating personal resources? How much we want to help people recognize what their abilities are. In the same way that, as, as I told you in the opening story with this woman discovering that she could manage pain, she didn't know that. She, for understandable reasons, underestimated her own personal resources. Hypnosis helped connect her to those resources. That's what hypnosis does. Well, there's a lot to say about the ambiguity and its relationship to anxiety and depression. But the risk factor is that people strive to understand meaning. They want to understand what it means. And when they can't form meaning, it raises their anxiety level. We want to know what it all means. That is our way of trying to assert some degree of control over it that if we can analyze it enough, it means that maybe we can get some control over it. So what we're really striving to do then is help people recognize and tolerate ambiguity. Now, in just a moment, I'm gonna run through a hypnotic process. For those of you that do hypnosis, for those of you that do guided meditations, I'm literally gonna give you a step-by-step -step procedure that I hope will be a useful technique for you. For those of you who don't do hypnosis and don't do any guided meditations, this can still be a template for how you can approach helping people get better at handling ambiguity without scaring the heck out of themselves. But these are the skills that this strategy that I'm about to unfold is, is uh, going to help people acquire. First, we need people to be able to recognize ambiguity even before they walk into the situation whenever that's possible. This person's go, gonna go on a job interview next week. They don't know what's gonna happen. It's an ambiguous situation. It would be nice to know that ahead of time instead of them being absolutely certain that if they say everything right, they'll get the job. That's not necessarily true. Knowing that with ambig ambiguous situations, the situation can have multiple meanings, different ways of looking at it. That requires a flexibility and perspective. Recognizing that this, no, no amount of research is gonna answer the question. There are many questions that we can ask that no amount of research is going to answer. No amount of research is going to tell you whether there are lives that we've lived in the past, so-called reincarnation. No amount of research is going to answer that for you. And so that means getting comfortable with being able to say, I don't know. Doesn't mean that you are unintelligent. It means we don't know. So here's the structure for doing a hypnosis session. And again, for those of you who don't do hypnosis, just get the gist of how we move people progressively, building on one idea from the idea before. Everything dovetails from one step to the next. So first, of course, is orienting the person to hypnosis, being able to say, okay, now we're going to do this hypnosis session. Sit back, relax, get comfortable. Then comes the induction process, whatever you're gonna use as a way of focusing someone. What a lot of people use is just a simple breathing exercise, or what some people call progressive muscle relaxation, what somebody else calls a body scan technique, but focusing on the body and suggesting muscular relaxation, muscle group by muscle group. 
and then building a frame of mind about thinking about these things, making it okay not to know since that's the direction we're moving in. So to begin by saying, you don't know what I'm gonna say, you don't know what you're going to experience, you don't know what you're going to learn, the person has to agree with that because they don't know what you're going to say. But the implication is you are going to be exposed to this. You're gonna have the chance to learn. You don't have to know yet, but eventually there are things you will know. How important it is then to introduce the process of inference. The problem with people is when they make projections and they don't know they're making projections, they think this is really what's going on. So they will say to themselves, the reason this person didn't call me back is because they don't like me anymore. Well, you jump to that conclusion, but you don't know that. You don't know that. But to help people recognize you're not doing yourself a favor when you make inferences or when you jump to conclusions when you don't have the evidence for it. So to then provide examples of those inferences, how easy it is for somebody to form a conclusion, form a projection without even realizing it. If I say to you, John and Mary are getting a divorce, and then I pause and say, so why do you think they're getting a divorce? How easy it is to make something up. And the problem with anxious and depressed people is that they think things and then they make the mistake of actually believing themselves. The next step is now reinforcing, okay, I understand why you wanna know things. I, I understand why you prefer certainty and clarity. It's helpful to be able to have confidence and to be able to have facts to make decisions without having a wonder. And so I can reinforce that with examples that there are times when knowing is a really good thing and when you really can know. So if I'm gonna go out and buy a car, if I ask the question, which car has the best gas mileage, that's researchable, that's testable. We can answer that question. The value of knowing helps us make a decision about which car to buy if our criterion for buying it is best gas mileage. But then I can also highlight the other side of the equation. There's also a value in not knowing. It's not weakness, it's not foolishness. There's a value in not knowing. If you have 100 people in a room and you ask them, how many of you would like to know the exact day, hour, and minute of your death? Most people would say, I don't wanna know. On a more positive example, how many people, when you ask them, do you want a boy or a girl? They say, it doesn't matter, I just want a healthy baby. They don't want to know. They prefer not to know. They want to be surprised. An example of not knowing being pleasurable. So offering those kinds of examples of not knowing. The, the joy of going off to college, not knowing what you want to do with your life and being open to discovering is another example. And then by reinforcing that not knowing is desirable in some situations, that you're better off saying, I don't know, than you are just making something up. But then you're providing context. When is it okay to say, I don't know? So all of these questions that we ask about COVID-19, the best that you can do right now is say, I don't know. Time will tell. And then comes compartmentalization. How do I let the question go without ruminating about it over and over and over again? So now we're at the end of the session. Let's integrate that. So when you find yourself making an inference, you can pull yourself back. When you make a projection, you can instantly recognize it and pull yourself back from it. When you face an ambiguous situation, you can be comfortable recognizing the situation's ambiguous, you don't know. Closure, disengagement, bringing the session to an end. Well, let's move on quickly to the second one, which is about rumination. Rumination gives rise to what many call the analysis paralysis, analyzing and analyzing and analyzing. And one of the things that we know about rumination as a coping style, it falls in the category of being a coping style, is that 
rumination is a very strong predictor of both symptoms of anxiety and depression. So this becomes another target for your treatment. How do you help this person through hypnosis, through guided meditations, focus on moving from rumination to action? If there is a cure for rumination, it's action. So when people are asking unanswerable questions over and over again, understandable why they're doing that. They think that by understanding it better that that's somehow gonna help them have greater control over it. And that's what they're desperately trying to do is attain more control over their circumstances. Uh, so it's understandable why they're doing that. What's curious is when you interview ruminators, they think they're doing something. They think that by analyzing, they're engaging in, in action. So one of the skills you're trying to teach them is this one. How do we distinguish between useful analysis and useless rumination? That's what's called a discrimination strategy. One of my recent books is called The Discriminating Therapist, where I list dozens of discriminations that someone would need to make if they're going to live in a way that's healthy. How do you distinguish what is and isn't in your control? How do you distinguish what you are and what you're not responsible for? In this case, it's how do you distinguish between useful analysis and useless rumination? And I will provide you with the key criterion. If it does not give rise to timely and effective action, it's useless analysis. We want to get people moving. We want to get people to engage in what's called behavioral activation. This is one of the things that we know from the depression literature. Many of my books are about depression. This is something I know quite well, that the people who are more active in treatment do better than the people who aren't. It should be a given for every therapist now, especially in light of the pandemic, to make sure that they're giving their clients things to do in between sessions so that you can encourage behavioral activation that this person can do things rather than just analyze endlessly. So that's when we're using hypnosis to prepare people to do tasks and experiments and to engage in positive activities. So all of these things are really valuable that can be accomplished hypnotically, that through hypnosis, we're encouraging people to engage in these kinds of positive activities that can help people feel better. Just analyzing, just understanding, just getting wrapped up in your feelings. And especially at a time like this, what's anybody going to feel except desperate? So again, discriminations. When is it a good thing to focus on your feelings? When is it gonna work against you? Everything that I've said about hypnosis as focal points, shifting focus becomes immediately relevant when your clients are focused on aspects of experience that are working against them. Well, now by way of summary, let me begin to talk about why learn hypnosis, use hypnosis. Well, certainly there is the empirical evidence that it works, that when we look at the literature about the effectiveness of hypnosis, it enhances treatment results. It's important to appreciate hypnosis isn't the therapy. If you take the time to learn hypnosis, you'll be adding it to what you do, enhancing what you do. You're already using suggestion. If the study of hypnosis means learning how to use suggestion more deliberately, more effectively. But the evidence is clear that if you do therapy without hypnosis, and then you do the same type of therapy with hypnosis, it does enhance in measurable ways treatment outcomes. All therapy uses suggestion. It provides insights into how people structure their experience. Very importantly, it highlights the malleability of experience. One of the things that just grabs me about hypnosis is it shows us perception is malleable. 
And when you consider how stuck your patients get, your clients get, stuck in a belief, stuck in a, an emotion, stuck in a memory, the solution is malleability, flexibility. And hypnosis demonstrates that your perception of your body is changeable as it was for this woman in pain, that your view of yourself is changeable. So instead of saying, well, that's just the way I am, your identity, your view of yourself is malleable. It increases people's sense of control over the experience, which is invaluable. And we can use it in a lot of different ways. Are we going to focus on feelings and amplify feelings? Are we going to focus on cognition and amplify cognition? Are we going to focus on your body and, and amplify physiological responses? There's a lot of potential for generating the qualities of flexibility. Well, I want to just share with you then a resource that you can share with your clients. I've spent the last two years working with two very smart and savvy tech people from Australia that have developed a, an app called Mindset. It's currently available for iPhone and iPad. Later this year, it'll be available for Androids. But you can download it and you'll see that here we have dozens of hypnosis sessions to help people manage various symptoms associated with anxiety and depression. Therapists are downloading them to be able to learn the processes. But more than that, they're recommending it to their clients. I hope that you'll check it out. I think you'll find it pretty valuable. And if you go to my website, you'll see that uh, I have a newsletter I send out a couple times a month that has new information, new studies that come out, book reviews, um, all kinds of inform informative things that I hope you'll find valuable. So you just need to provide your name and email address and we'll be happy to add you to the list and make sure that you get it. Uh, on my website, you can check out the Mindset app and you can learn about the various hypnosis pr training programs that I do. So I hope that this whirlwind tour of hypnosis has been meaningful to you, that as you discover, you're going to use suggestion anyway, and to create this very focused context where people can respond to suggestions in far more amplified and powerful ways is the best of reasons to take the time to learn hypnosis. So I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank AMFT again for sponsoring this talk, and I hope it's been valuable for you. Thanks so much. Chris, back to you now. Thank you for that, Dr. Yapko. I also want to thank our sponsors again for the series, CPH and Associates. I hope that you have all enjoyed our session. If you are interested in attending a future one, don't forget to RSVP at amft.org forward slash at home.